Okay, so the last three lectures here, uh, what we're going to look at is the great event in world history, which is the Industrial Revolution. And it turns out that by 1850, uh, Britain had gone from being this tiny peripheral country in Europe to being the major world power, this kind of colossus astride the globe. And uh, the thing that's interesting about Britain is it's only 0.16% of the land mass of the world. And even by 1850, it only had something like 1.8% of world population. Probably at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution in 1760, Britain might have had one person in 200 in the world was actually in Britain. And yet, by 1850, it's alleged that Britain was producing two-thirds of the world's coal output, a half of the iron production in the world, and something like a half of the cotton textiles that were produced in factories. And so, in, described in this way, it just seems like this amazing event uh, which transformed uh, this country. Uh, and also, at the same time, Britain became the world's uh, major military power. Uh, it had a navy uh, which was the largest in the world, British naval doctrine actually called upon it to be bigger than the next two navies in size, so that it could defeat any two people combined, any two other countries defined, uh, combined against it. Uh, it had incredible colonial possessions, uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, uh, large chunks of India and Pakistan, Ireland, uh, parts of China, uh, parts of Malaysia. Uh, and so it had kind of spread across the globe uh, in 1842, in the Opium War, it forced the proud uh, Chinese Empire uh, to cede Hong Kong and allow the British to import narcotics into China. <laughs> uh, because its possession of India meant that one of the big uh, goods being produced there was opium, and the market for opium was in China. Uh, and so this was uh, why there's a, there's a long history of kind of Chinese nationalism because of the humiliations of the 19th century. There was a question here. 1842. Okay. Uh, and then by 1860, the British and French together uh, marched into Beijing, uh, cap captured the capital, uh, and forced uh, even more treaty ports on the Chinese. And by 1855, Chinese tariff revenues were actually collected by the uh, colonial powers and then remitted uh, to the Chinese government. The Chinese government wasn't even trusted to collect its own uh, tariffs. And tariffs were set at these very low levels uh, in China uh, to stop them from blocking the importation of manufactured goods. Uh, and it turns out that the British colonial pursuits in this period were actually largely devoted to the prosecution of free trade. The British government actually preferred not to occupy other countries. It just wanted access to the markets of other countries. And it tended to move in when the local rulers became protectionist uh, or were unable to administer the territories. So actually, what the British wanted was the world market at that stage. And we'll see why when we look at the growth of the textile industry in Britain. Britain was the major producer for the world textile market. And even as late as the late 19th century, uh, within a sh uh, 30 miles of Manchester in England, was producing about 40% of the entire world output of cotton textile goods. And so you had this incredible uh, transformation uh, of uh, uh, Britain's position in the world. At the same time, for example, uh, Britain, in the case of India, entered into a free trade <laughs> agreement with India which allowed goods and capital to flow back and forth between these two countries, even though in the 19th century, Indian wages were somewhere between a quarter and one-sixth of those in Britain. And yet, the British didn't fear uh, entering into this uh, free trade uh, arrangement. And so it's similar now to, say, the United States and Mexico, where there was all this doubt and worry in the United States about the effects that that would have on the US economy. Uh, the Industrial Revolution actually also transformed Britain itself. Here's a very rough sketch of Britain. All the way from the medieval period, the bulk of the wealth and population of England had been concentrated on the more fertile lands in the south and the east here. And London was the, the capital and the giant city uh, of Britain. It turns out 
that most of the growth in the Industrial Revolution period in terms of the high productivity industries actually occurred in the north of the country and in Scotland. And so this traditionally backward area of Britain became the heart of the British economy. Uh, and towns like Manchester up here uh, had incredible growth in the Industrial Revolution period. At the start of the Industrial Revolution period, Manchester only had something like 17,000 people. By 1830, it's up to 170,000. And so there was this enormous growth of wealth and population in the, the north of the country. And one of the puzzles actually in explaining the Industrial Revolution, if you want to explain it in institutional terms, is that had Britain been divided politically here on this line, the Industrial Revolution would have been regarded as a phenomena of this country here. The south of England had the same relationship, it seemed, to the Industrial Revolution as France or Germany had. And so another puzzle is that it's not just this tiny country that's being transformed. It's actually a subsector of this uh, tiny country that's going through this uh, transformation. And interestingly, by the way, the, the North continued to dominate the British economy until World War I. Somehow the events after World War I caused a relatively rapid collapse in the northern industrial sectors of Britain and the reemergence re of the South as the dominant part of the country. And so now the wealth and the income is all concentrated in the South of England. And it actually shows up in terms of, you know, on the South Coast here, there are towns now in England where life expectancy is 10, 10 years higher than it is in my hometown in Glasgow in Scotland. <laughs> Uh, and that's just a reflection of now this, this, this traditional pattern actually returned so that this area had a period of something like 100, 150 years where it was this, this kind of advanced uh, part of the world and then somehow it all reverted again after World War I. And so this account of the Industrial Revolution makes it seem like some incredible detective story. I mean, what happened <laughs> in this tiny part of the world which represented, as I say, an entirely new phase of human history in terms of the rapidity of economic growth and the rapidity of technological advance. And it makes it seem like there must be some secret, you know, it's like uh, the, 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 the holy grail or something of economic growth is going to be dug up from a hillside in Manchester. And, uh, and one, that's one of the puzzles in explaining the Industrial Revolution is why would it be in just in this particular uh, part of the world? Um, but it actually turns out that the Industrial Revolution is actually quite a complicated series of events. And in fact, we'll see that there are actually four separate revolutions that somehow coincided in Britain in this period. We'll see that sometime after 1760, there's the classic events of the Industrial Revolution, which was a technological transformation of industries by means of innovations. And we'll see that there's a set of industries that are transformed in this period, the most important one being the textile industry. And something like 60% of all the economic growth in Britain in this period can be attributed to that transformation of the textile industry. And so you get then, that's the classic industrial revolution where something happened in terms of innovation in this economy and led to this dramatic uh, change. Right? And that growth in the textile industry also was very important in explaining why Britain then had this huge political interest in dominating the rest of the world because very quickly they were producing so many textiles that they had produced enough for the entire British population. They needed a market in the rest of the world in order to sell these textiles to. And we'll see that it just becomes the dominant industry in Britain in the 19th century. So that's the classic industrial part of the Industrial Revolution. But here's this amazing coincidence. British population in 1760 was not much higher than it had been at its medieval maximum in 1315. In 1315, there's about uh, six million people in England. Uh, on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, it's not much beyond that level. So there's actually been very little change. And this is the kind of static Malthusian world. And it's also suggesting there's been relatively little productivity advance in Britain all through this period. Because remember, population growth is a, a measure of, of productivity advance. Population began to grow very rapidly in Britain in the Industrial Revolution period. And British population 
uh, is more than twice as big by the end of the Industrial Revolution. And Britain changes, it becomes a much bigger country and it becomes also one of the most densely populated parts of the world as a result of this population boom <laughs> which occurs in the Industrial Revolution period. And one puzzle is why would these two events coincide? We'll see that that population boom had to do with just the kind of the basics of marital behavior by people all across the English economy. And the puzzle is why through all of history <laughs> Would you have a coincidence? And it's really, it's within something like 10 or 20 years, the coincidence of these events, uh, where suddenly population begins to boom at the same time that you have this industrial revolution. And then a third thing also happens in this period, which is that that higher population in Britain somehow had to be fed. And Britain begins to, by 1815, 1820, it starts to import food on a large scale. And now it's a country that's, that needs very substantial food uh, imports. Uh, but most of that population was actually fed by English agriculture in England. And that seemed to imply that there also had been an agricultural revolution at the same time as the Industrial Revolution. Because people were richer in the course of the Industrial Revolution. Richer people, as we see, eat more food. They want more meat. They want more butter. Uh, there's a much larger stock of people, and it seemed that the output of the agricultural sector in Britain roughly at least doubled and maybe tripled in the course of the Industrial Revolution. And so it raises this other question, and, and, but it turns out we'll see that that agricultural revolution had nothing to do with mechanical innovations. And also in the Industrial Revolution, we can actually locate the people that launched the Industrial Revolution. We know the people, the men, <laughs> principally, who were responsible for that change in the modern world. In agriculture, we can't find anyone who was actually responsible for this. It must, must have been just thousands and thousands of small-scale farmers figuring out how to do things better. And again, the puzzle is the agricultural revolution exactly coincides with this revolution and this revolution. And so the puzzle is, why is that happening, right? Agriculture seemingly had very little productivity advance over the past 500 years. Now it's being transformed, and so it's raising this puzzle about, well, well, what, you know, why is the whole of the British economy energized in this period? Uh, what happened to this society that caused this transformation, and how could it be such a relatively sudden transformation? And then the last of the, the great events in this period is that there's also a transport revolution within the British economy. Uh, transport in pre-industrial Europe was typically notoriously uh, slow. Uh, we actually have good evidence in terms of speeds of travel because there were coach timetables that were published uh, starting from at least the mid 17th century. And so we know that the average speed of coach travel in Britain in something like 17th century might be two miles an hour. Right? I can walk at four miles an hour, <laughs> right? And so the average speed of travel across the economy is actually incredibly slow. And as a result of this, people really don't want to travel long distances. So Queen Elizabeth, I believe, I won't have the exact number right here, but reigned for something like 42 years at the end of the 16th century. She never made it further north than about 200 miles from London, even though the, the northern border is 400 miles from London in her, her entire reign. <laughs> Uh, there were large chunks of the country that she never even saw. Uh, and so travel was very slow. It's very e expensive because you have to stop all the time overnight in inns. Uh, in the 17th century, it took six days to get from London to Edinburgh, which is about the same distance as from here to Los Angeles. Uh, and so, it, you know, it's, it's, it's surprisingly slow, the speed of movement of people. What happens in the 18th century is that the cost and speed of travel on traditional road networks in Britain improves very dramatically. Uh, and the thing is, though, this is mainly an organizational revolution. They actually figured out a way of how will we build good roads again. They knew how to build good roads ever since the Romans, right? The Romans left behind a bunch of roads in Britain when they evacuated the place. Um, then the road system deteriorated in the Middle Ages. And one of the problems simply was that the way the roads were paid for was that the local village that the king's highway ran through was responsible for maintaining it. 
the villages often had no interest or no means in order to do that. And so the, the road network was terrible. And in particular, in winter, the whole road system would deteriorate once the rains came. Uh, and in some areas, actually, um, when roads ran through open fields, these non-enclosed fields, people would start striking out into the fields trying to find an easier way through. And so in some places, the roads would be hundreds of yards wide, but just full of rutted, water-filled holes. <laughs> uh, and, and, but they knew actually how to make much better roads in this period. But there simply wasn't the organizational structure behind that. And what they actually did was effectively they privatized the road network in Britain in the 18th century and simply said, you can build gates on these roads and you can charge people to use them and you can use that money in order to maintain the road network. And with that, they actually very rapidly, in the course of something like 20 years between 1750 and 1770, remade the entire road network in Britain. And again, the puzzle comes up. Why would they build something like 15,000 miles of new roads <laughs> just on the eve of this technological advance, this demographic revolution, and this agricultural revolution all occurring at this time in Britain, right? I mean, why? Yeah, I mean, and I'd say that's what creates this incredible puzzle is why would you stagger through world history for 100,000 years, never achieving any major sustained period of technological advance? and then get to this minor country on the edge of Europe in 1760, and suddenly it seems everything's happening. <laughs> uh, and, and, and yet, we actually know that the political system of Britain is largely unchanged, right? That there had been this significant change in 1689, but nothing happened in the British economy for the next two generations until we get to 1760, and it's a period of no major political changes within the British economy. And so the obvious kind of easy institutional explanations just don't look that plausible. It has to be something more protracted, more prolonged. And, and as I say, one of the puzzles is, if the Industrial Revolution really was such a sudden event, it's going to make it an incredible mystery in terms of uh, why was the world transformed this way. So what we're going to do first then is just go through and describe a little bit the details of what actually happened in these different uh, revolutions. And the first one we want to look at is the actual classic uh, industrial revolution. And here it turns out that there's actually a list of industries that are transformed. Um, the first one is textiles, and that's the most important, as I say, about 60% of all the growth of output in Britain is if, if you're going to be attributed to the textile industry. The second one was the introduction of steam power into the economy. And as I say, another of the puzzles here is this is a completely separate technological development from this one here. It's a completely different technological idea, steam power, than textile production, and in fact, uh, steam is used to power these textile mills, but you could have actually powered all of these mills well into the Industrial Revolution just by using water wheels, right? There was plenty of water power available in the, in the British economy. And that's one of the things then, when people try and explain the Industrial Revolution as being from the fact that Britain had coal, because you use coal for steam engines, <laughs> uh, one of the, the problems is that, you know, a country like Japan, which didn't have easy access to coal, had tons of water power. <laughs> And it had a cotton industry at the same time as a much bigger cotton industry than Britain had on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. It had all the prerequisites in order to have its own Industrial Revolution, right? And similarly, China had a very significant cotton industry. India had a very significant cotton industry in this period. And so the question was, what was the particular advantage? If it was going to be some geographic feature, it turns out steam power is very, it is important in this period of the Industrial Revolution, but it itself actually it is completely separate and it's not really required for this. By the way, these early steam engines were actually used to pump water back up through water wheels, right? So you would run the water down and then you pump it back up the hill <laughs> and then you run it through the water wheel again because they needed smooth power for these machines and the early steam engines were too shaky. I mean, they would have shaken the machine to bits. So you actually just use them for, to push the water back up the hill and then run it through the wheel again. Uh, the third revolution, the uh, industry here, was iron and steel. Uh, the fourth one was the railways. 
And then the fifth one is coal mining. So these are all sectors of the economy which grew dramatically in this period and had significant uh, technological advances. And what's interesting here is that actually these are all interconnected. <laughs> and so another argument here might be just accident that you had a set of technological advances that then produced technological advances in other areas, but these are not connected with the main technological advance of the Industrial Revolution. Okay? And the reason these are interconnected is Britain had these reserves of coal and had, was mining significant amounts of coal. Right? And coal mining creates a set of technological problems. As the mines get deeper, they had huge amounts of coal in the Northeast, for example, but they knew you had to keep going deeper to get you exhausted. The surface seams, and then you go down, and they knew there were more of this stuff down there. But you know, by the time they're into the 19th century, they're running 1,000, 2,000 feet down <laughs> into the ground. And then the problem you get is when you drive that pit shaft down, it's running through underground strata that have water in them. And the water leaks into the shaft, and it's going to drown your mine workings unless you pump that water out. So the, so the barrier is the deeper you go, the more water you're going to get in the pit, and the more you have to pump out. And so that's what the, uh, the early use of steam engines was for. And, and so they had this technological problem. They needed something. They could do it with horses. But it takes a lot of horses to do that. And one of the big advantages of, of early, early steam engines were incredibly inefficient in terms of the conversion of the coal into actual usable power. They have something like a half percent efficiency. Right? By the late 19th century, they have steam engines that are 25 percent efficient. Right? But it took a long time along that technological path to develop those so that the early steam engines could not work in any area where fuel was expensive. But one of the features of coal mines is there's a huge amount of really cheap fuel. <laughs> there's a lot of waste coal just sitting at the pit head. Most of the cost of coal is actually the cost of transporting it from the mine to the final consumers. And so that's why there's a connection between coal mining and steam power. Right? And then it also turns out that once you're producing a lot of coal in the economy, it creates a lot of demand for transportation of heavy goods. It also, railroads actually developed initially in the coal mines. So the idea of transporting goods over railroad, they actually had an extensive horse hauled railroad system in the northeastern coal mines at the period of the Industrial Revolution. And then the other thing is that iron and steel, to produce that in large quantities, was not possible in Britain before the Industrial Revolution because the traditional iron and steel industry used wood to make charcoal to make iron and steel. Britain had chopped down most of its forests by 1760. There's very little wood left in the economy. Iron and steel then is produced in Europe in places like Sweden and in Russia. But another of the, the key technical development in this industry was to figure out how to use coal in order to produce iron and steel. And then once you figure that out, you've got this incredible supply of coal. <laughs> you can start producing this on a very large basis. So there are actually, there is this set of industries actually has these interesting interconnections where it would be possible to say the big thing the British had was a, they were sitting on a mountain of coal, right? They're sitting on a pile of coal and that's what allowed them to transform their economy. Except for the fact that you've got this other completely separate revolution that's going on here, which had very little connection with these other industries, and where the only interconnection really was that you used coal eventually to, to power these, uh, these uh, mills. But, but the, the cost of power for the uh, textile mills is mainly, you know, it's like two or three percent of the total cost of production. So even if you'd had to switch to water, and that was two or three times as expensive, it wouldn't have dramatically impacted uh, these mills. So that's the, the array of industries. Now, let's start and then talk about uh, textiles specifically. So textiles, and particularly cotton textiles in this period, was the equivalent of the computer revolution that we've had in the recent world here. And they had their Silicon Valley, which was the area around Manchester in this period. And to see how dramatic this transformation is, we know exactly how much output they were producing in the textile industry because all of the imports 
All of the, the industry depended on cotton, which was all imported into Britain. And we have the complete records of how much cotton was imported. And to produce a pound of cloth takes a fixed amount of cotton. So we know exactly how much output they're producing in different periods. And so in 1760, they had a very small industry which imported about three million pounds of cloth for use in England. Uh, sorry, three million pounds of cotton uh, for use in England. Uh, and as I say, it's a minor textile industry. Uh, and a lot of that cotton would actually be used for uh, candle wicks and various other purposes, actually not actual cloth. By 1850, that industry was annually employing 621 million pounds of cotton. <laughs> it had risen already by the 1830s to be something like cotton alone was about 20% of the imports of the British economy. And cotton goods were about half of the exports of the British economy. So it just became this giant industry. And it had these global political consequences because as the industry developed, you needed a, a reliable and cheap supply of cotton. And so the growth of Britain in the Industrial Revolution period is tightly connected to the development of slavery in the US South. Uh, and it was very important also the productivity advances which were made on the slave plantations in terms of supplying much cheaper inputs to the industry. So, that, so again, another argument that's been made is, well, why was this revolution occurring in uh, uh, Europe as opposed to in Asia? Well, there's this connection then between the colonization of the Caribbean and Brazil and uh, uh, southern parts of the United States and the need for the supply, huge supply of this raw material to the industry in Britain. Uh, the cotton industry, as I say, was about 0% of GDP in 1760. By the mid-19th century, it's almost 10% of output in the British economy uh, are cotton textile goods. But it's not just the cotton textile industry because there's a whole bunch of other industries which use different fibers, which are all then starting to be transformed. So cotton goes first, but next is linen, right? Uh, next is the wool industry. There's also a jute industry, which uses jute from India to produce heavier things like uh, floor coverings, sacking. Uh, there's also a silk industry. Uh, which is similarly being transformed in this period. And so it just, it's a revolution that sweeps through all of the textile industries. And each fiber is different. They have different technological problems in terms of mechanizing their production. But gradually, all of them are transformed in this period. And as I say, the, the interesting thing about the, the, this industry is it's been intensively studied so that we know the personalities who actually uh, transformed this industry. And so the next thing we want to do is draw up a, a little kind of table, which is going to just list, and it's in the book, if you don't get any of the details here, uh, the innovator, the device, the year, and the result. Okay. And um, the first uh, big innovation in, is actually a little bit before the classic industrial revolution and by this guy called John Kay. And this is actually a revolution. It, but remember, this period, there is no cotton textile industry. It's tiny. So this is actually to do with the woolen industry. And so he's an, uh, uh, a weaver, an artisan, craftsman in the north of England. And the, the interesting thing about this industry in this period is we'll see that the people who transformed the world are not scientifically trained. They're local mechanics, they're tinkerers. Go to the Davis bike store, right? And those are the kind of guys, or you know, your local car mechanic. Somehow these guys are transforming the world, right? It's not actually coming from the universities. The universities have academic learning that's of very little value, mostly, in this, in this period, right? There are a few, so James Watt is the one person actually who's coming from a university background. So John Key is there, and his device is actually called the flying shuttle. Okay, and I'll explain in a second exactly what the flying shuttle consisted of. And that was actually earlier. It's 1733. Uh, and what was the result? Poverty. <laughs> uh, and so first of all, let me explain exactly what the flying shuttle uh, is. 
and, and the reason I want to go through this, these innovations in detail is because I want to illustrate that these are things that could have been invented a thousand or two thousand years earlier, some of these things, right? That's one of the puzzles here is it's not, you know, that you needed calculus or anything to do this, right? It's got nothing to do with the advances of science. It's simply people thinking, hold on, there's got to be a better way of doing something like this. So what is the flying shuttle? Well, in weaving cloth, you have these long threads, which are called the warp. And then you have to interweave the cross threads, which are thinner and less strong, which are the weft, right? And so I'm sure in, in your English classes, you've heard expression of stuff about the warp and weft of life, you know, the interweaving of all those elements that makes up the fabric of human existence. No, okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, so you have the warp and you have the weft, and you've got to insert the weft here. And what happens is, if you look at the loom horizontally, is that all these threads are lying here, and, and on each insertion, you lift up a different set of the threads, and then you fire across the weft, okay? And so this is called the shed. And the early way of doing this was that the weft thread would just be on a little bobbin, and you would throw it through the shed and catch it with your other hand, right? And so that's how weaving was done <laughs> for thousands of years, right? Was you would throw it, catch it, throw it, catch it, right? There are two problems with that as a technique. One is if you want to make a cloth that's wider than the distance between your hands, you need two people <laughs> to do it. And the second is that it kind of slows down the procedure. I mean, even though people get pretty adept at doing this, it's a relatively slow procedure, right? What was Kay's innovation? Kay said, well, why can't we mechanize this? And why it's called the flying shuttle? So it was the shuttle was the thing that was thrown through. So it's just a bobbin with thread on it, and the thread unwinds as you throw it through. He built a little vehicle with wheels <laughs> where the, the shuttle actually sits here, and the thread comes out like this. <laughs> And then on either side of the room, of the womb, uh, the loom, <laughs> there's actually little boxes. And there's springs here. And what happens is these are connected to strings that the weaver has at the front of the loom. And the weaver jerks the string, it fires the shuttle across, and then the box on the other side catches it. And then you jerk it again, and it shoots back across, right? And so it's just a it's very simple device, I mean, mechanically, it's difficult to get this to work, right? You have to spend some time to get, well, how exactly is this going to work? But it had quite profound productivity implications because for a start, now you can actually weave wider cloths. And the second thing is, it's estimated to have doubled or tripled the speed of weaving. You can just do this much faster. If you just, once you get into rhythm with this string here, right? And, and that became the basis, by the way, this kind of shuttle technique is the basis of, uh, you know, weaving up until, now they have shuttleless looms, but for the next 200 years, essentially, okay? Uh, and, and so it's very simple idea, but as I say, the ancient Romans could have done this. I mean, it's involving a little bit of metal, wood, uh, and it, no great kind of technological inspiration, okay? And so uh, what actually happens to Kay is that he then attempts to use the property rights system in order to patent his innovation. He is impoverished by litigation trying to enforce his patent. And the reason is that once anyone else saw this, this is so simple, once any other craftsman, carpenter, you know, clock make, you know, maker or something like that saw this, they could reproduce it, right? And so you couldn't enforce your property rights because it's just like software piracy now. Once you sold a few of these devices to someone, they could get someone to come in and say, make me copies of this thing. And it's used, weaving at this stage is a domestic industry. Weavers typically weave in their own homes. They have these sheds attached or there are rooms above the homes. And so trying to get these people, you'd have to sue all of these individual people, bring them to court, and then often they just, they're renting their accommodation, they don't have any property, you can't recover big damages. And so basically, you couldn't actually recover profits from this industry. And then, uh, poor Kay, uh, his house was destroyed by machine breakers in 1753, 
because the weavers objected to these devices because by increasing the productivity of weaving, it's actually reducing the demand <laughs> for weavers, or at least they feared it was going to reduce the demand for weavers. And eventually, he was actually invited to France by the French king and set up in a royal manufactory. And they tried to then, under royal sponsorship, introduce the device uh, to uh, France. But he actually died somewhere in France in poverty in 1764. Right? And it's going to turn out that this is actually pretty much the standard story of these innovators early in this industry, which is that they're trying to make money <laughs> in this period. I mean, they're clearly motivated by this. Uh, but it's very hard, actually, with these innovations to make a lot of money because of the, the, the very the poorness of the property rights regime in uh, a place like uh, England in this period. And then interestingly, this device spreads all the way through the British weaving industry. In France, despite royal sponsorship and royal promotion, it actually fails to spread very widely. And it's later in the 18th century, it has to be reintroduced to France. And so another puzzle is, it's not just that the people are producing these innovations, it's also the case that producers are very receptive to trying to use these innovations, right? And so, so it turns out it's a little more complicated. It's not just you've got to have an innovation. It's also that people are very willing to say, OK, let's try that, right? Okay. So that's the first one. Uh, the second innovators in the Industrial Revolution period are guys, I'll just give their last names, Wyatt and Paul. And they produce a spinning machine. And that's produced in 1738. And uh, what happens to them? Poverty. Uh, so Wyatt and Paul actually devise, get the key idea of mechanical spinning or that later comes to dominate. And so they, they, th they, they figure out how you actually can mechanically spin thread. But the problem of often of these early innovations is you might have the right idea, but it takes a long time and a lot of capital to actually make this into a viable machine economically. And they simply ran out of money <laughs> before they could get to that stage. And so they had a factory. And I think uh, Dr. Johnson, the famous dictionary owner, had a share in that factory, which ended up uh, being worthless. <laughs> right? uh, and uh, they just couldn't get the device to actually work. But the interesting thing is that when Arkwright comes in, it's essentially a copy of that early device that he eventually patents. And, and, and it turns out he's the one, guy who makes money, but he makes money because he can figure out the problems of production. Uh, what are these guys, again, uh, I think it's Paul is just a dilettante younger son of some relatively rich family. I think Wyatt is a ship's carpenter, right? So again, these are not, you know, people from universities. They're not people with high engineering background. The interesting thing is that they're just interested in this possibility <laughs> of spinning thread using a machine in this period. But so you can see that in the period leading up to the Industrial Revolution, there is actually this period of kind of failed innovation. Or not failed, I mean, this is successful, but there's a, there's a precursor period, right? And it's just the case that once we get to the 1760s, somehow this rate of innovation uh, really takes off. But that's we'll do on Monday. <laughs>